Hi, Pastor Scott, Pastor of the Oasis Church. Listen, we are so glad you've decided to join in and listen to what God has placed upon our hearts. We pray this will be a great resource for you, but it won't take the place of your local church. We encourage you that if you're not a part of a local body, that you get involved as quickly as possible. We pray that this will stir your affections towards Christ. Enjoy. If we were to look back throughout history, uh, if we were to look at all the things in which God and the way God has moved throughout history, uh, even amidst the most dire and crazy of circumstances, we would see that God always has a plan and a purpose. Uh, we as a church just got done reading uh, in our reading plan through the book of Amos. Now, for those of you that are like, man, I'm glad to be done with Amos. I want to make sure I help you for when we go through another minor prophet. Here's the deal with the prophets. You got to keep reading them over and over and over again. And so uh, what you need to realize is that when the Bible says Israel, don't put Israel equals America because you're going to put a hermeneutical uh, law on yourself that will break you. And so here's what's really cool. When you see Israel, insert your own name and find out if you can find some application there because here's what the book of Amos did for us is, man, it convicted us, right, of how we worship, how we think about worship, right? And so you get to that point in Amos, right? And he's like, listen, I don't even hear you anymore. Like your worship is obnoxious to me. And if look, if that didn't convict you in our reading this past week, man, I, I just don't know what to do, right? Like that was unbelievably helpful. And as I told my home group on Tuesday, as we talked, I said, listen, are we as a people of God preparing our hearts to come into worship? Before you come into worship, before you come into this place, before you come into home group, are you preparing your hearts for the word of God and what he has to say through his word? And what I love about the minor prophets is they bring us into this one truth. They grab us by the shirt collar, bring our face right up to this one truth. Are we worshiping God or are we just worshiping the stuff God can give us? And that becomes so highly convicting for us because worship becomes something about who we are and what we do. We do not worship the things God gives us that's worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And Paul says that leads us into futility and it, let, and it casts off the grace of God when we think that. So what do we do? We worship God as he says, God, you give, God, you take away, but I will always sing your praises. And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks through um, November and December is we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of Old Testament passages that point forward to the one worthy of our worship, Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel. And so I, I got to tell you, just my conviction as a pastor, I was born and raised in the church. I was a little church rat. And man, they would always tell us how important the Bible was, but so rarely did we go to the Old Testament and the Old Testament is so rich for us because it just teaches us so much about who God is and who we are. And so what we're going to see this morning is we're going to see the very first people who ever sinned, Adam and Eve, and we're also going to see how those people are also the very first believers and who put their faith and trust in God himself. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. If you don't know how to get to Genesis, it's the book right after the table of contents. So if you hit Exodus and Leviticus, you've gone too far. So Genesis chapter 3, if you've been with the Oasis ever since I got here, can you believe y'all will be three years come February? Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and so if you've been here since that time, you're like, if this guy preaches Genesis 3 one more time, I'm going to run out of here. And so um, just know this is the good news that there are people, even our first service, I was like, I've never heard Genesis 3 preached in my life. Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 will be the building blocks for you on how you understand the rest of the Bible. If you don't understand Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, the rest of the Bible will be ultra confusing to you. 
And so the Bible's set up this way. You've got the first two chapters in Genesis, and it's the world without sin. And then in the last two chapters, it's the world without sin. And so everything in between those moments is God's redemptive plan, bringing humanity back to himself, because you and I all have been led astray. We have all gone our own way, and we have turned our faces from God. And God, being a just God, cannot just let sin go unpunished, undealt with. He has to deal with it because he's also a loving God who wants to give you grace and mercy, abounding in faithful, steadfast love. And so what I want us to see this morning as we look at just another way in our text as we anticipate the Messiah in the Old Testament is we get to see what a treasure it is to know the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. And so that's going to be our goal this morning is I want us to see this Genesis 3, this fall, and how it anticipates the Messiah, how God had a plan before the fall. And so understand this, get around this. Y'all, you, if you are in Christ, you were predestined, you were chosen in him before time began. So before time began, God called you by name to be in him. So Jesus Christ was the plan before time began. And then before even Adam and Eve fell, God had the plan of the cross already on the books. And so understand that this is why Christ becomes the preeminence in our worship. This is why he's the pinnacle of our worship. This is why everything we do is about Christ and Christ alone, because it's Christ who justifies us. God is all the just and the justifier. And so we're going to see the first promise of Christ in Genesis 3 this morning. So uh, before we do that, let us pray together as a church. Let's seek the Lord's face, and then we'll hear the preaching and teaching of God's word. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. We thank you, um, God, that you're a good, good God. God, that you're both just and loving. God, that even when there was not a way, you were a way maker, that you created a way. God, we thank you for the glorious truth that you treated Christ as sin so that you could treat us as righteous. And so we pray that we'll see that truth this morning. Now, church, I said you pray for me. I said you pray that I'll be helpful, that God will humble me behind his cross, that he'll humble me into nothing so that Christ may be exalted. Now, church, I said you pray for yourself. Pray that God will speak to you. He'll open up your ears, your heart, your mind to hear from his word this morning. Father God, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. God, we pray that it'll cut to our hearts this morning. We pray this because of your son's atoning work on the cross through the spirit that's alive and active within us. Amen. So let me just get us, before we dive into Genesis 3, I want you to understand what Genesis chapter 1 and what Genesis chapter 2 sets up. Genesis chapter 1, Moses is the author of Genesis, and he sets up for us the seven days of creation. So you have the seven days of creation. And so what we see in Genesis chapter 1 is in the beginning, God. So this is the beautiful part, is the first few words of the Bible tells us about everything we need to know about this Bible, that the Bible is about God and God alone. So the Bible is not about you. It's about God. And it's how God redeems his people. It is the story of God. It is about God. It is how God reveals himself. With as much respect as to the little anagram thing, Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. That's way too shallow for what the Bible actually is. The Bible is God's self-revelation. It is, it is honey to our lips. It is the light unto our feet. It is the most important thing we as believers can be doing is to be reading God's word and praying to the God of the Bible, how he has revealed himself. 
And so in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. We're going to get back to that in a second. But what I want you to understand is on the sixth day of creation, the very last day of creation, he creates his pinnacle, his greatest creation of everything. And that's human beings, mankind. He creates Adam. And so I'm going to break some hearts this morning, but that's okay. Um, All I got to say, if you disagree with me, bring your verses and let's talk. Cut me up. Prove me wrong with the verses. It says this interesting, fascinating phrase. Let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. Well, what the heck does that mean? And so let me share with you what that means. God, when he created us, gave us what we call communicable attributes. That's attributes we share with God that the rest of creation does not share. So what do I mean by that? What's a communicable attribute? Love. God is love, right? And you and I have a capacity, although imperfect, to love. The animal kingdom does not know love like you and I know love. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, my dog Fluffy comes up and nuzzles its head under my hand and gives me that cute little puppy dog look. Guys, that's training. That's not love. You feed it. You pet it. You show it affection. Of course, it feels good. Of course, it's going to do that. But that's not actual love. Why? First John chapter 3 says, this is love that Christ gave his life for us. So we lay down our lives for who? The brethren. Another communicable attribute God gives us is justice. That you and I desire justice. We do not see the Supreme Court of Appeals in the animal kingdom right? Regardless of what Lion King says, that's not how it works. And so understand this. You don't see some lion eating a gazelle going, oh my gosh, why do I keep doing this? That doesn't exist. Why? Because we've been given communicable attributes, right and wrong. And so again, anything you see with animals is just training because they don't want to get hurt. They want to feel pain. But it's not these communicable attributes. So these communicable attributes is what man is given. And then we get to Genesis chapter 2. And what is Genesis chapter 2? It is the zoom in account of the creation of man. And what does it say? That he created man out of the dirt. Think about that for a moment. If you ever think you are just something awesome, realize you came from dirt and to dirt you'll return right? And so that's what he does. He creates man from dirt. And then what does he do? He breathes life into man, God's breath into mankind. What does that tell us? Every breath we take is a grace of God given to us. That God, okay, so God gives that breath to us. And then he gives one law, It is so easy. You could have it memorized by the end of the day. Adam and Eve, do whatever you want here, but of this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of it, right? Easy one command. And let us find what happens. Oh, by the way, in that command was the promise, if you eat of this tree, what? You will surely die. So Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall, never, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Uh, Genesis 3 is a really popular one. Even if you haven't been to church, uh, you see it a lot in paintings. Um, there's a few kind of fun debates we have in Genesis 3. The big debate is what was the fruit that Adam and Eve ate, right? And everyone kind of assumes apple because that's where it came around the Middle Ages. People are like, oh, it's probably an apple. Uh, it just says fruit. All of us pastors have crazy theories. Mine is a fig because God often likens his people to a fig tree. So that's the one I like personally, but it doesn't matter. If y'all know anything about the Apple Company, their emblem is an apple with a little bite in it. That is a reference to Genesis chapter 3. Steve Jobs, very creative with that. I always like that. So uh, that's the one debate. The next debate, and all you church rats are going to lose your mind when I tell you this, The next debate that scholars like to have in Genesis 3 is, who is the serpent? Well, it's Satan, pastor, duh. That's an easy one. Show it to me in the text. Oh, I'm not sure. And so let me show you where actually we get the understanding that uh, Satan and the serpent are one and the same. In Revelation 12 and Revelation 20, John says this. 
the great dragon, the ancient serpent, who is called devil and Satan. Now that's, that's pretty obscure references because Revelation has a lot of symbols. Uh, the other reference people give is in 2 Corinthians 11. Paul starts off 2 Corinthians 11 and he mentions that Eve, Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent. And then later he reminds us that Satan can disguise himself, what? As an angel of light. So I, I tend to say that and look at that and say Satan has disguised himself as a serpent in the garden. And so this is why this becomes important. We must understand who Satan is. And this is going to be a little review for you from a few weeks ago. If you're with us when we finished off Ephesians 6, we really dove into this. So if you want the full sermon, go check it out online. But I want to make sure we always understand this. Satan is a created being created by God, right? Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, you had the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, perfect in unity, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty, right? So in the beginning was just the, tr the triune God, and then he creates what? The heavens and the earth. So what is the heavens? The heavens is the heaven, and it's the heavenly hosts and beings that go along with that. And so that is in the day one of creation. Now, in Jude, we see this beautiful reference that Jude says that there was a rebellion in heaven, and in that rebellion, a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. And John in Revelation says, he, behold, he says, behold, I saw angels, and they were uncountable. So a third of uncountable, that's kind of the demons to ratios of angels you have. And of there was Hasatan, Satan. And this is what you must understand about Satan. Like I said, he is a created being. Martin Luther says the devil is God's devil. He is a dog on a leash and God holds the leash. Amen. And so what we see in the text, in Job, in Luke, and in other passages, anytime Satan does anything, he has to ask permission from God. Okay, this is not Zeus and Hades, a dualistic kind of deal going on. This is God sovereign over all, including Satan himself. And this is Satan, and this is how he, this is how he tempts you and me. Did God actually say? Satan's very first step is to get you and I to question the word of God. And so his first question to Eve is what? Did God actually say? Verses two through three says this. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. So this is what important. Don't you see it? God never said anything about don't touch it. Now, I'm going to give Eve the benefit of the doubt. She had really good intentions. She's like, look, if I don't touch it, I won't eat it, right? But what happens is, is this is what we often see in our lives, in cultures. You've got three types of people. You have those who are like in Romans chapter 6 land. And what are they saying? I can do whatever I want because God loves me. Shall I continue to sin so grace may abound? And what does Paul say? By no means. Then you've got the other one. These are the legalists. So Eve was your first Pharisee because she put a law on top of God's command. And she said, what? We must not even touch it. This becomes the struggle because in her desire to be obedient by putting a law on herself is actually what causes her to really fall. And so this is where we find the gospel, not between these two things, but we find the gospel in trusting God and being obedient to God, regardless of circumstances, because Christ has paid it all. And so we are free in obedience because Christ has paid it all. So it's not legalism and it's not void of law. It is the gospel and the gospel of, of it all. And remember, Here's the beautiful thing we must understand. They had one command, don't eat of this one tree, and they still failed. You and I have 66 books of the Bible that we must know. And so friends, we must be very specific in our theology. We must be very specific in the word of God. And so this is why theology, the study of God, the study of the Bible becomes so vitally important. It's why we must never neglect it because here's why. 
if you notice Eve, she messed up her theology and her messed up theology led to what? Horrible application. If you have messed up theology, you will have messed up application. And so this is why theology becomes so vitally important. We must know what the word of God says. Well, that's a big book, bro. Yeah, but here's the cool thing. People like William Tyndale was burned at the stake so that you and I could have the Bible in our native tongue. And you and I have not only the Bible in our native language and English itself, but we got more translations than we can count at our fingertips. We are without excuse of knowing what God's word says. And so my dear friends, we would be a lot better people if we spent more time reading God's word than watching the fear that is propagated in our world. To much is given, much is required. You have been given the whole counsel of God at your fingertips. And if I can just tell you for a moment, if you are thinking and looking for the special revelation of God, you have it at your fingertips. It is the word of God. Because what does the whole Bible say? If you have something supernatural come, you better test everything against the word of God. We should love the fact that we have God's word with us. Verse four through five. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you notice how the serpent, how, how the serpent manipulates? Notice how he tempts us. He first starts off, did God actually say, so he's going to get you to question the word of God. And the next statement, the next phrase, the next temptation is what? I'm now going to get you to question the goodness of God right? If you ever talk to any hardened atheist, what are they going to tell you? If I was God, I would not do this, this, and this. But they can't actually maintain that truth because if we were to find and really look at their lives, we're going to see how horrible and wretched they are for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And so what we realize is we're not, we, we realize we don't have a good understanding of what good is because of our fallen nature. And so Satan will always try to get us to question the goodness of God. He's gonna, you're going to look around and you're going to see all the horrible things. And what? If there's all these horrible things, God therefore must not be good. But what does the Bible say? God chastises, he disciplines those whom he loves. So if you are caught thinking in that satanic preaching that health, wealth, prosperity comes to you when you're a Christian, man, talk to the apostles and let me know how that conversation goes for you. Think those brothers love God just a little bit and they died poor. And they died tortured. Why? Because they realized that their greatest treasure is not in the things of this world, not in the things this world can offer, but in Christ and Christ alone. Then we see something happen in the next Genesis 3. The woman takes and she eats. Now the question we all have is what? Where was the brother? Where was Adam? It says he was standing right there the whole time. And so again, if you want to hear that sermon, go back to Ephesians 5. Husband lo- or wives, submit to your husbands. Husband, love your wives. We deal with that there. But this is what I want you to understand about Genesis 3. It is the responsibility of the church to maintain holiness amidst the church. What do I mean by that? It would be immoral, unbiblical, and in fact unloving to watch a brother or sister in the church continue in sin and not step in and call them out. Ecclesiastes tells us two is better than one for when one falls, the other can pick them up. In Galatians chapter six, verse one, Paul says this, if any one of you is caught in any transgressions, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you to be tempted. And so understand this, church. It is so important that you and I desire the holiness in your life and in my life that we, as Hebrews 10 says, spur one another on to holiness. Not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some. And so this is 
the truth that we see that God has given you a community of believers. Why? So that they can call out your blind spots because I want people to call out my blind spots. Then we see something interesting. So they take, they eat, they realize they're naked and they are shameful. And then what happens? It says that Adam went and hid himself. Uh, the, the kind of what we assume happened is he just left Eve standing right there in the middle of the road. He goes, hides himself, upstanding dude, right? And then she's, so she's like, well, I'm not standing here. So she goes and follows him. And God comes and he says, where are you? Second masculine singular, Adam. And so let me just share with you, if you think you're playing hide-and-go-seek with an all-knowing, all-powerful God, you ain't winning. And so here's Adam hiding behind a little bush, and God's like, bro, I see you, but where are you? He's giving Adam a chance to come forward and repent of his sins. Do you notice what God is doing here? He's reminding us that in our sins, we should be running one place and one place only, and that's to God. One place and one place only in God. Because why? He's the only one who can forgive us and to save us and to cleanse us. Your good works can't cleanse you. And then what happens? Brother Adam, he does what? The woman you gave me. So he sins by pointing fingers elsewhere. What has Adam just done? Think about what he's just done. God gave him a gift. Remember, it is not good for man to be alone. Not good for man to be alone. So he created for him a helper suitable. God gave him a gift of the woman, and now he accuses God of being unloving and not good because he gave this woman to him. He indicts God for being wicked. And so God realizes Adam is not going to confess and come clean. So what does he do? He turns to the woman. What have you done? And what does she say? The serpent did it. Does God buy that? No, he does not. Now, God now has a problem. God is both holy, just, but he also loves his creation. He promised them, if you eat of this tree, you will surely, what, die. So God has a problem. How can he be just and loving simultaneously? And this is what I want us to see, because God makes a way where there was no other way. Jump down to verse 15 with me. This is the curse of the serpent. So God then goes back to the serpent. He starts with the serpent and he starts to give out his curses. So he starts with the serpent. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, sorry, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Do you see what God just said? I will put enmity, I'll put strife, I'll put conflict between you, the serpent, and this woman. Why? Because Satan came to put enmity between man and woman and God. He came to divide God from his people. And what does God say? No, now they're going to start fighting against you. I have turned the tables on you, Satan. And here's how it's going to happen. I'm going to send a man. Do you notice how it's in the singular? He he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. One man's going to come and he is going to destroy Satan. Satan, you just signed your death warrant. He has just destroyed himself. And this is what the picture Moses, what God through Moses wants you to see. He wants you to imagine the curb stomping man stomping the head of the snake as the snake bites his heel. And this is what he wants you to see, that it will be destroyed. The power of sin and death will be destroyed forever. Why? Because you can't live without a head because it's been stomped. And so throughout the whole Old Testament, what we see is we see God's people doing what? They're looking for that boy. They're looking for the man. They're looking for the he that will come and crush the head of the serpent. This is the hope. This is their anticipation. The whole Old Testament points us forward to the promise that God is going to save his people. The next thing the whole Old Testament points us forward to is the simple fact that you and I don't need a better law. We don't need a better leader. 
We don't need better circumstances. We need a whole new heart. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, John chapter 3 all say the same exact thing. I'm going to make you into a new creation. And so what is this? This is not the gospel when he crushes the head of the serpent. It's you and he fixes you up a little bit, right? This is God giving you a whole new heart. Why? Because Satan came to make mankind hate God and God saying, I'm going to come and make mankind love me and hate you, Satan. So for those of you who are in Christ, what do you do? You hate the things of Satan. You hate the things of evil. You hate the things of this world and you love righteousness. Why? Because you've been given a new heart and it's bent where? Towards God. It's what we saw in Ephesians chapter two. What did it say? We were all born children of wrath. We need to be created new. And so this is what becomes the promise Think about this. This was the first gospel promise they had. And this is their promise. But I want you to see how they respond to God's promises. Jump down to verse 20 with me. Jump down to verse 20 with me. Um, this is so vitally important, church. You heard me say a few weeks ago that, the faith, that faith is hiding behind the promises of God and trusting in those. That faith doesn't look around to what we can see. It looks around to what God has promised. And I want us to see very clearly how Adam, how Adam understood the promises of God. This is in verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowledge of good and evil. Now, lest he reach out and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Did you notice something? Prior to verse 20, we never knew the name of Eve. It was always Isha. It was always the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman. And now what do you have Adam? And what does he say? I'm going to call her name Eve. And Moses wants to make sure you and I understand this. So when the Bible actually explains Hebrew and Greek words, pay attention. It's really important. He says what? Why? Because she is the mother of all the living. So what is Adam doing here? Adam knows he's now messed up. He's heard the curse. Cursed is the ground in which you will work. Cursed for you, woman, for you're going to be, child, child labor will be painful. But he knows the curses, but now he's realizing he is messed up. And where does he put his focus? Into the promise of God for this one boy that will come from a woman. That is her name. Paul makes this point in Romans. What does he say? That all sin and death came through one man, Adam, and life will come through one man, a better Adam, Jesus Christ. And how is he going to do it? his heel will be bruised. He will be crushed on that cross for you and for me. The next thing, verse 21, and the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Where in the world did God get the skin? Remember his promise? If you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Something died that day, and it was not man and woman. There was a substitutionary atonement. There was a sacrifice that took the place of Adam and Eve, and it was two innocent, cute little animals. He killed them. It was his, it was his sacrifice that he killed so that he could cover the guilty party. And this is what we understand about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not something that is just taken lightly. If you want to show me how well someone understands the gospel, you can know by how well they understand forgiving one another, forgiving one another. Because what is forgiveness? When you've been wronged, you have one of two options. Option one, you can make them pay you back for all that you have lost so that the scales will be even. And therefore, 
Therefore, if that is our understanding of, if that's our choice with God, that we're going to do that, then that is why eternity in hell is our just reward and punishment. Or option two is you who have been wronged will pay the price and not hold anything guilty against the person who wronged you. This is the gospel, friends, that this is why it's so important that Jesus said what? No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. That Jesus on that cross was not killed by nails and whips. He was killed by the wrath of God being poured upon the spotless lamb, crushing him. Why? Because it was God's sacrifice in order to atone for the guilty party. This is why Jesus, when he talks about the strong man must be bound, what does he say? Strong man must be bound. So what does Jesus do? He is bound on that cross so that Satan could be bound and thrown into the lake of fiery hell. Next thing we notice is a simple fact. Like I said, when we find ourselves in sin, the fingers start to get pointing, right? The fingers start to get pointing. If it's porn, well, we live in the most sexualized time in history. If it's divorce, well, she just doesn't care about me like she used to. If it's gossip, well, the ass and all, I, I didn't want to really hold my tongue because I want to sound cool. If it's road rage, well, they're going too slow. If it's complaining, well, things should be better than this. We're always pointing our fingers elsewhere instead of doing what the Bible calls us to, repenting and turning from God and saying, God, you are my treasure. Why? Because you have clothed me in Christ's righteousness. And if I have all of Christ, Christ, nothing can stop me. And this is the good news, y'all. If you find yourself in a storm, and I, I know a lot of you are in a storm this week, here's the good news. What that storm, what the waves of that storm will ultimately do is it will knock you against the refuge of Jesus Christ himself. And so this is the joy of this fact that there was a promise that we will be clothed, not in our righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. Not through works, but through grace and grace alone so that no man may boast. The next thing I want you to notice is this really weird phrase, this really weird sentence. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Why is this message, why is this passage in Genesis? You ever think about that? That's a really weird phrase. What is God actually saying here? Well, think about it. If they, because they're evil right now, they've not been 100% atoned for, they've not been given a new heart, but if they go and they go to the tree of life and they eat of that tree of life, they will have eternal life. How? Wickedly. And so what does God do? God drives them out. He drives them out of the garden to ensure that they will not eat of the tree of eternal life. Why? Because they need to be atoned for. They need to be atoned for. And so this is why he says, now we don't want them to reach out their hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Why? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, they gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall have what? eternal life. You get to Revelation, John sees what? Two trees. This tree, the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of eternal life. And so yes, for all of you who are in Christ, you will eat of that tree of good in eternity, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The next thing I want you to see is God moves without our permission. God moves without our permission. You and I have a habit of thinking that we are so much greater than we actually are. Um, as I just pointed out to you, the world doesn't revolve around you, and it doesn't revolve around me. It is for God, by God, for God. It is all about God. And so what did God do? God moved. Notice, God cursed the serpent, put redemption into plan before he cursed the man and the woman. That is God's love. That is his mercy that he put salvation in place before curses were given. And then we see this in verse 23 and 24. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of, from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword and turned every way to guard the way of tree of life. 
I want you to notice something. And we often forget this when we're reading the Bible because we read it like we're reading the newspaper, right? Like, oh, that's really nice, right? Or whatever. But notice, these guys aren't trying to get to a word count. Every word is specifically placed in there. So why in the world did Moses tell us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he drove the man out the east gate? Have you ever wondered that? Well, think about the sun for just a moment. The sun rises where? In the east. What is man's curse? To work the ground. So think about it. If you're a farmer, what's your alarm clock? That sun right? So here he gets up and he's got to work the ground all day. That's his alarm clock. So as the sun rises in the east, he's remembered about, he's reminded about the curse he had to take and the sun sets where? In the west. So if he's driven out the east, I don't know if that's east, I think that's north, but y'all with me. If he's driven out the east, right? And he sees the sun setting, he's looking back to all the things he lost. The garden, salvation, uninterrupted time with God. And so man is forced to work the ground as the sun rises in the east and be reminded of all the things they lost as they look back to the sun setting. Now, where do we see this language? In the Gospels, all the Gospel writers tell us one thing, that Jesus was crucified when? At noon. And at about three o'clock, at about three o'clock, He gives up his spirit and he dies on that cross. Now think about that for a moment. If if they understand noon as being the highest point of the sun, then three o'clock, it's starting to go back down towards the west. So what Jesus is pointing out to you and to me on that cross is he's saying, I have opened up the way of salvation. And how do we know that's exactly what he's saying? Because think about what Luke tells us, that there was a man who was being crucified next to Christ. And he says, don't forget me, Lord. And what does Jesus say? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will be with me. He doesn't say heaven. He says where? Paradise, the garden. Jesus is opening up the garden. How? Through the cross. And this is the glorious truth that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. His heel was bruised for us so that the serpent's head could be crushed with one blow. And so the cross sits at the center of all we are as believers. My friends, without the cross, we are forever in our sins. Without Jesus Christ himself, you and I are guilty So this is why it's so important. This is why righteousness, right standing with God is so important. And there are writers, N.T. Wright, for example, who have totally destroyed righteousness by justification through faith alone and grace alone. There are writers who are trying to say that your righteousness comes by external works. My dear friends, if that is true, Christ died in vain. And so what we see is the very truth that you are counted righteous, how? By God through faith. Um, One other kind of thing I want to point out to you in the Synoptic Gospels, it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all tell about an event, the temptation of Jesus. In Mark's Gospel, he says what? The Spirit led him away to be tempted. But Matthew and Luke, they give a very, very specific and detailed account of the temptation of Jesus. Do you remember what his first temptation was? He's been fasting for 40 days, and what is the temptation? Take and eat. The very first temptation of Jesus was the very first temptation in Genesis 3. And so this is why that is so important. Understand this, because what does Jesus respond with? Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. What's Jesus saying here? If you're worried about your circumstances, worry more about your spiritual circumstances. Love love God himself more than the things God gives you. Why? Because it says what? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough problems of its own. God is already there. He's already planned for it. He's already taken care of tomorrow. And by the way, you and all your worry is not going to add a day to your life. What does he say? Worry about your communion with me. The last temptation Satan tempts Jesus with in the wilderness is what? 
He takes him up to the mountain and he says, all this is yours if you do what? Bow down and worship me. It's a weird temptation, don't you think? If Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords, he's like, dude, I already own it. Why is that a temptation? But what is he saying there? He's saying, you can have all of this without the cross. And if he took that, he, we would still be in our sins. And this is the beautiful thing where you and I have failed, where you and I have fallen short, where you and I have sinned, where you and I have messed up. Christ has done it perfectly. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says why he is seated at the right hand of God and the world is his footstool. So what does all this mean and how do we, why does this matter? My dear friends, the cross radically shifts our perspective. The cross radically shifts our perspective. That we are, not, we are not citizens of this world. We are not citizens of this country. We are not citizens of the state. We are not citizens of the city. We are not citizens of our own houses. We are citizens of heaven, ambassadors living in foreign territory, pleading with people, come to know Christ. Be reconciled to God. And Paul, in Romans chapter 6, says what? You're either there's two, one of two types of people, slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. So know this, everyone in this room is a slave, slave to sin, slave to righteousness. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, what about my free will? To quote Charles Spurgeon, will I've seen a lot of, free I have never have seen. Okay, that's okay. You free will people are mad at me, that's okay. It's fine. You all deal with the text. So what does that tell us? Very simply, that you must decide which master is yours. Is it the things of this world? Or is it Christ who crushed the head of the serpent once and for all? You must decide, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day who you will serve. I'm trusting in the one who crushed the head of the serpent. Let us pray.